Yep. Anthony, what's good, my brother? How you doing, Fetty? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Glad to hear. Uh, well, brother, I really appreciate your time and deciding to participate in this call. Um, as I've told you, man, through the company highlights, we've been just basically helping helping youth with their videos, just helping them get some more guidance on like what the college route is. And uh, last week we had our first session, and for a second session, I was like, "Who is better to you know talk about the path of you know playing college soccer, uh, life after soccer?" And I and I think, man, you you're just a great example, not only of a player but of a human being. I know of your humane qualities. I know how how good of a person you are, which I really think is what matters beyond the field. Um, so. So here I have uh, Sebastian Ballesteros. Sebastian is uh, my partner in highlights. Uh, he played uh, NCAA D2 in Texas, uh, lived the process. And, uh, you know, we started this company together. Just basically whatever we didn't have, you know, we're, we're putting it forward. And here we have um, some guys and girls that some, some are already freshmen in college. And most of them are either uh, juniors and seniors. In, in the DR and we're working with them to help them get to to the to the college level. Hey Anthony, nice to meet you, brother. Glad, nice to meet you. Glad that you're here, man. Really appreciate that. Of course, of course. Thank you guys for having me. <clears throat> great, great man. So um I made all of them put their camera. So if they look shy, just you know give them a chance. Um but but man, they all wrote some really good questions, uh, which I want to ask you after after you just basically, you know, just introduce yourself. And then if you can give us just basically your point of view on what is self-awareness and, and emotional intelligence for you. Um, what we're doing every week is just choosing a topic that really ingrains what we believe sports leadership is. So just, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself from whenever you started playing to how you got to college. I told them you uh, won the Michigan Player of the Year, which I know is a really big uh, award. So just, you know, tell us as much as you, you can and you think could be of, of value to them. And then just your thoughts on self-awareness and emotional intelligence. Sounds good. How much time do I got? Oh, wait, give me a second. I have... There we go. Uh, now, man, just just go ahead, bro. Just go ahead. I think all of them already did their homework and had dinner, so we're all ears. All right, everyone's on the call then. Yep. Yep. All right. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate you, Fetty. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for everyone for listening in. Um, so yeah, like Fetty said, my name's Anthony Bowie. Um, I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, my whole childhood was spent there. I played basketball, baseball, soccer growing up. Um, played four years of varsity in high school and, and played club soccer. We won a couple of state championships in club soccer, um, went to national tournaments there. And then in high school, we won a state championship as well. And then I went on to, to Western Michigan University, a Division One school uh, in Kalamazoo, so about an hour from home for me. Played four seasons there and then spent um, – three and a half years there. So I graduated a semester early with a sales and business marketing degree. And then right after college, I, I had the desire to, to play professional soccer if the opportunity arose, but I ended up having to have a surgery. So that kept me out for about eight to nine months after college. And then from there, it was another six to eight months um, before I found a professional contract. And, and my first contract was in Chicago with a third division team professional there. Um, and in the league called uh, National Independent Soccer Association, so NISA. Um, and then the last two years, I've been with a club in the same league, third division in Michigan. Um, and we ended up winning in the championship last year. We just finished second in the regular season this year. So we have a bye week. Um, and then the following weekend, we have our semifinal. So we'll look to try and defend our championship there. And as far as self-awareness and emotional intelligence, um, for me, I think self-awareness starts with understanding your strengths and weaknesses. Um, so what do you bring to the environment that you're going into each day? Uh, what do you excel at? Um, what are areas that you need to improve on? Um, and understanding what that looks like for you and also understanding for other people 
um, what their strengths and weaknesses are and how you can utilize each other's um, to, to create the best environment for everyone. And then as, along with self-awareness, um, understanding your motivation. And, and for me, it comes down to I'm trying to maximize um, the potential that I have and the gifts that I've been given um, to be the best that I can be, not thinking too much about, you know, can I be better than the guy next to me? Although in the profession that I'm in with soccer, um, to get playing time, you, you have to be better than the guy next to you. Um, but, but for me, that's not necessarily my motivation is beating out the guy next to me. It's all about focusing on the process that I have for myself to be the best that I can be. And then lastly, when I think about self-awareness, it comes down to environment. You know, who do you surround yourself with? Um, and what are you doing to, to maximize those skills that you have? Um, always finding people that know more in the game of soccer, um, know more in the business world, know more in, in communication, you know, self-awareness and emotional intelligence and of these topics. Find people and surround yourself with people who um, want the best for you and will continue to challenge and give you feedback and criticism, um, constructive criticism so that you can grow. Uh, and for me, when it comes to self-awareness, a time of growth that I think of um, is my freshman year of college, freshman year of high school, and then my rookie season as a pro. Um, and just the difference in terms of like the self-awareness that like you're starting over at that point, um, that you're coming in and, and whatever you've done in the past doesn't matter too much. It's all about what you bring to that new environment and just putting your head down and, and continuing to work um, and listen and soak up as much as you can to, to learn and grow quickly because each level that you progress up requires that you learn faster um, than the previous level so that you don't fall behind. Um, and then that growth into now where I am playing my third season with a pretty young roster. I'm one of the older guys on the team. And then my senior year in college. And in that time, you're one of the guys that's setting the standard day in and day out and, and showing those younger guys and teaching them all that you've learned from people in the past um, and, and helping them to, to maximize their potential. And then emotional intelligence, um, the things that come to mind for me right away is, you know, when to speak and when not to speak. Um, so understanding, um, you know, the right moments. And, and that for me is something that I'm not necessarily the best at. I'm a pretty emotional person. So, you know, at first when someone gives me feedback, I might ask questions or and it, it might come off as defensive, but I'm understanding, you know, what their viewpoint is and trying to understand to the best of my ability so that I can implement this information that I'm receiving. Um, and I think even going back to my example of when you're coming in um, new into an environment, you know, not speaking too much in your mind, but just listening, growing, um, taking as much in as you can. And then when you're asked to step up into more of a leadership role, um, you know, learning what you've learned in the past, what you didn't like, what you did like, and trying to implement that to the best of your ability. And then next with emotional intelligence, I think about navigating the highs and lows. Um, there's going to be some good moments in your career, in your life, and there's going to be some bad moments as well. And, and for me, a lot of my ability to balance this comes from uh, my faith in God. That's an important piece for me in understanding like how to navigate the valleys and, and how to navigate those mountaintops. Um, but also just emotionally not getting too high in those good moments and not getting too low in those low moments and knowing that those seasons of, you know, the good and the seasons of the bad, like they'll pass either way. And then I think that leads me into the last point with emotional intelligence is, is being present. So being present to your work, to your relationships and understanding what they require out of you each day, um, emotionally, physically, and then what you have to bring um, into work each day and then understanding the relationships that you have to build with the people around you. Um, and, and lastly, a time of growth when it comes to emotional intelligence for me um, is my last season um, with the Michigan Stars. So about halfway through the season, we had dropped a couple games. And, and when we lose a couple games, it can be a difficult environment to, to be in. And so I was at a low point. A lot of guys around me were at a low point. And I remember our coach, his, his name is Stu, He's from England, and he's a big sports psychology guy. Um, and he got us all on a Zoom call similar to this and just said, hey, guys, like, 
here you are, like we're, you're playing professional soccer for him. He's a professional coach. It's, it's what we've dreamed of. It's what we've prayed for. Um, it's what we've manifested in a sense or however, it, you know, however you pray or, you know, ask for something or desire or dream about whatever it is for you. Um, here you are and you have this opportunity to do what you've grown up or what you've you know dreamed of growing up. And for me, that was always to be a professional athlete. Um, and so that for me was like a turning point last year. Um, and just understanding that, okay, like I have this opportunity. Um, and, and it ended up, you know, it ended up working out all right. We ended up winning the championship. And for me, I was able to score the game winning goal in that, that game in the final. So it was just like a cool moment of like, you know, going through that low moment um, and learning to deal with it emotionally and then going to those high moments um, and, you know, just those emotional highs and emotional lows and um, just learning from, from the people around you. Um, and that's pretty much all I got in terms of self-awareness, uh, strengths and weaknesses, motivation and environment, emotional intelligence, um, when to speak, when not to speak, navigating highs and lows and just being present in the moment. Um, I'm not an expert in these areas uh, of emotional intelligence and self-awareness when it comes to sports leadership. I'm still trying to learn just like all of you guys. So um, I'm excited to hear your questions about any of my experiences in life and in soccer. I, I do have one question, man. I, you mentioned that you had an injury after your last, after your senior year in college, yep. right? How was that? How do you deal with that adversity, knowing that you have prepared four years for your senior year, you have done it, you graduated, and you're about to play co a professional soccer and you get injured? How do you deal with adversity at that point in your life? Yeah, that that's a great question. Um, and I have to go back to high school even because for me, I had three surgeries in high school and a couple other broken bones that didn't require surgery but kept me out. So I had been through all the highs and lows in high school, um, coming back from injury and getting back to my best my senior year. And um, like Betty had mentioned um, the award for the best player in the state. Um, so I, I thought I had learned every lesson that I could from those highs and lows. And then after my college career, I'm hit with the same example. And um, for me, the, how I managed it, um, I, I can't tell you exactly how I remember honestly going to scripture and, and reading a verse, uh, I believe it's in Matthew 8, 23 to 27, and it talked about storms. Um, and basically, like, in a sense, for me, what I took from it was like, you know, I had been brought through those previous storms um, and come out even better. But here I am questioning, like, you know, why do I have to go through this again at the moment? Um, but then I was brought back to like, okay, like it worked out in the past. And I just have to trust um, that there's something for me to learn from this opportunity. Um, and like I said, it all ended up working out. It took longer than I would have hoped. You know, it took me about six to eight months to, to find a team. But um, it was a great environment for me and one that I learned a lot in. Um, and I wouldn't be here where I am now if I hadn't gone through that surgery. Um, because of that. a lot of people were introduced to me in that time um, that have helped me to, to become a better athlete and a better person. I, I can't imagine. It just made you stronger, right? Yeah. Yeah, in the end. Um, it's not something I, in a sense, like you never wish to go through those injuries. Um, but, you know, when they come, and inevitably they will come, those storms will come. Um, you know, it's about just resetting in, in that moment and, and being present in those low moments because it makes the good moments that much sweeter. I agree. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. We have some other questions, Fede. You have them? Yeah, yeah, I have some some other questions that uh whenever we sent out the form of uh, the guys and girls sent here. Um but I don't know if anyone wants to say anything before I read these questions. Um I was seeing a lot of nods while Anthony was talking. Don't know if And if I was you guys, I would introduce myself because if you guys are looking to play college soccer or are already playing college soccer, Anthony's very humble, but he's he's a very well known guy. So I would uh, introduce myself and just let let him know who you are. Um, if you play, Anthony, you play right back currently, right? 
Yeah, uh, so I played right back in Chicago for that season. And in the last year, I've been playing winger, center mid, and, and outside back as well. So kind of just learning to adapt right now to different positions. Uh, you played in college, you play center mid, was it? In college, more of right mid, left mid um, at times, cam and striker or attacking mid and striker. Just overall. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, well, man, let me, um, let me go ahead and ask you some of these questions. Um, the first one is how do you approach a coach that may not be interested in you? That's a good one. I think for me, um, I wouldn't take, so if a coach isn't interested in you, that doesn't mean the door's necessarily closed. Um, I, I think I'm a big person on like, you know, if, if someone doesn't believe in you, you, you have an opportunity and a window to, to make them a believer in you, whether that's through your, your work ethic, um, your attitude each day. Um, I, I think people's perception can change if they're originally not interested. But if they're not interested, and I had college coaches, um, you know, who were interested at first, and when I had some injuries, they weren't interested. Um, and that's the reality. There will be people that won't be interested. So I think it's just learning from them if they're able to give you feedback and taking that feedback and improving in the areas and, and the reasons why they might not be interested in you as a player, whether that's, you know, decision making or technical ability or um, athleticism, like whatever it is that they're looking for, like how can I improve in that area so that the next time a coach comes around that might be looking for a similar thing, they're not going to they're not going to be disinterested in you. They'll be interested in what you can bring. Yeah, I think that uh, you touch on a very important point um, because we have here uh, Alan, Joshua, and Camilo. They are all in their first year uh, playing in uh, in a junior college in I in Ohio. Sorry, Iowa, Iowa, Iowa. and uh, man, they they thought they were gonna have it easy, and they got there. Very competitive team, so. You know, they, they've had to learn the hard way that you have to earn respect. You have to earn that playing time. You don't just get there. And because you were good somewhere else and you were liked somewhere else, that means you, you're going to just have a red carpet wherever you go. And um, so the next question would be, what advice do you have for players that want to go D1? That's another good question. And I would just, you know, hit on the fact that I, you may want to go D1, um, but it's all about finding the best fit for yourself. Uh, when it comes to college, like it's not only just the sport, um, you know, playing soccer and finding the right staff, finding the right environment for yourself, but also the academic side, um, because that's something that's going to stay with you for a lot longer. Um, and, and for me, you know, I had an opportunity where, You know, I had other Division One schools that passed. I had other Division One schools that were interested that maybe it would have been, you know, you got to sit for a year or two. Um, but Western was one that, you know, they, they were keen to bring me in and, and said that there would be an opportunity for playing time if I earned it. So I think it's just being prepared, um, you know, for that opportunity. Like, are you at the level of a Division One player right now? Um, I think that's the key because if you're prepared, the opportunity will come and when that opportunity comes you'll be ready to take it i think that's the most important piece is just training understanding what they do at the division one level what what is required um, what coaches are looking for um, and then you know having that technical ability the decision making speed of play those are all things that all coaches division one will be looking for um, so just making sure you're working on those areas so that you're prepared for the opportunity Um, I'm not sure. Did that? I guess did that answer the question? Oh yeah, I think, and and I think also that that ties back to what we were saying about self awareness. That when you're in that position where you're asking yourself, okay, what do I need to do to become the one? You gotta be objective and you gotta be realistic with yourself. And, and and let's say, okay, I'm not the fastest one. Well, let me improve my speed. You know, be being able to acknowledge your weaknesses and find a way to, to, you know, to make them not strengths, but to neutralize them and your strengths make them even stronger. 
I feel that that's when it how it ties back to self awareness. And once you understand them, it, it just gets easier for you to get to that uh, to that level. Because it's not that it's not that you're not able to get there. It's just that okay, are you willing to acknowledge the things that you're not doing right now in order for you to solve them and then get there? You know, that's the question. And I feel that that's something that everybody needs to ask themselves if they really want to go to one, you know? Yeah. And and even if you're a senior in high school and you want to go division one and you don't have any offers, there's JUCO teams, there's NAIA teams, there's division three teams, division two teams, all better than some of the worst division one teams. So find an environment where there's players that you see every year transferring out to division one schools. Cause maybe with the reality of the way, you know, college sports are working, um, not many people are staying all four years all the time anymore. So maybe it's finding the right place for you to grow for a year or two. And a lot of times in your first year or two, it's just, you know, your gen ed classes. So you're usually able to transfer those classes. Um, you know, if you're really set on playing division one and you're not ready at the time when you're coming out of high school, maybe it's about finding a good fit for a year or two and then finding that right fit division one, or maybe you fall in love with the school that you go to and spend four years there. Um, so, you know, there's, there's different paths. Like my path was to go division one right out of high school. And I was able to get playing time my freshman year, but that's not everyone's path. At, my, at Western alone, we had about 12 to 16 transfers, I would say in my four seasons there. So we were bringing in two or three guys every year um, who were transferring from, from different backgrounds, from JUCO schools, from NAIA schools, uh, Division two, Division three, you know, wherever. Anthony, two more questions, brother. Um, so we always, uh, so here we have a lifting program, which is a 5 a.m. workout session three times per week which we started a year ago, uh, just to start showing showing these players what really playing at a college level is. And, uh, you know, some of them complain that whenever they have a game, they can't go to the 5 a.m. workout or they're tired. And uh, I'm sure you're, you know, you're a professional athlete, so I'm sure you have a very structured routine of working out. So I wanted to ask you, outside of, of the times you train with your team or the, the allocated sessions you have, what's like your, your personal workout routine outside of what your team, you know, schedules and stuff? Yeah. So typically when it comes to lifting, um, we usually get to the facility about an hour, hour and a half before training. So a lot of guys will do, you know, maybe a quick 30 minute lift before training or some guys will stay for 30 minutes to an hour after training. Um, typically, that's how I like to do it, just because we have a gym at our facility. I like to get it all done in one time, but we have plenty of guys on our team um, who you know, come to training in the morning, and then they'll go do a gym workout in the afternoon. For me, I, have my, I work a part-time marketing job as well, so that's typically what I'm doing in the afternoons. If I do anything, it's you know, some recovery work, um, more so like foam rolling, stretching, um, different things like that uh, versus, you know, the gym. Um, that's usually right before training or right after training. Um, that'll get something in. But definitely those those 5 a.m. lifts, like those are going to be moments that maybe you don't like it at the time, but you'll, you'll reflect back um, and, and you'll enjoy it. I know for me in the off season, so I train Monday to Friday at a normal time, and then we have 6 a.m. training sessions on Saturday. And for me, I honestly love the 6 a.m. training sessions. Like, it, it sucks to get up for them. And I'm not a morning person. But then it's like you have your entire day after that. And you've got the workout and you've done the work. Um, so I think it just, for me, it's it's a very satisfying thing when you have the rest of your day ahead of you. And, you have you know, you put the work in for that day. Peter, if you do the hard things, everything becomes easy. If you don't do the hard things the easy things and they just become hard uh, after. Um, no, man, thank you for, for sharing that. And brother, one last question. This, I think it's a really good one. Um, which role models had a significant impact on your athletic career? 
Yeah, that's that's another good question. I, I think for me, a lot of my love for sports came from my dad. Um, he played basketball, baseball, and soccer. Uh, he played soccer in college in the U.S. He grew up in Nicaragua. Um, and I think, yeah, he, he always just, you know, different sports. I played tennis, golf, um, just whatever it was. You know, he, he always kept kept it open. Um, so he was a big role model for me and just getting me involved. And then from there, it's, it's coaches um, and, and different players, you know. Um, I loved Michigan State basketball growing up. I loved Tom Izzo. I loved the program and, and the discipline and the players that, that he instilled. Um, as far as soccer, um, I'm a big Liverpool fan. So I, I love the times of watching, you know, Steven Gerrard, Luis Suarez, um, Coutinho, all these guys more recent and everything, and, and Mo Salah right now. But um, I think all those guys, you can you can look to what they do, um, and just how disciplined they are. And for me, I just appreciate the greatness of any athlete in any sport um, because I know the work that it takes to get to that level. So there's a lot of people I could point out, but for me, again, my I'd say my biggest role model is just my dad, um, and the, the love that he gave me for sports and even him leaving, you know, Nicaragua to come to the U S for college, um, all on his own, like just something like that is like, you know, those are life role model lessons that, that translate into sports and just taking risks. Awesome. Yeah, it's always, it's always good. Uh, it's always good to to know who you look up to and be grateful of those that have made sacrifices for you to for you to get to where to where you are. Um, and now, man, that's uh, that was all the questions that we had. Um, I don't know, guys, any or girls, if you have anything to say or comment. And just uh, really grateful, Anthony, of all of your. I know you prepared for this. I knew you would. Uh, I'm glad you did um, because I know it's it's just of a lot of value to us and to, to these guys and girls that are really on their journey, just like you were. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, we, we appreciate that. And as, as Pere said in the beginning, we try to do this for them because we know that we need it at some point in, in our lives, you know? So thanks for doing this. You, you're really adding a lot of value to them. Like Pere said, and, now you have 12 more fans that are going to be watching your games in Chicago. Yeah. Alan, Joshua, and Camilo, they, they live 30 minutes away from you. Not 30 minutes, like an hour away from you. Okay. So they might go watch your game sometime. But, man, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Of course. And, and Fede, you have my contact information. Feel free to share that with all of them if they have any questions in the future or even – you know, want to hop in the phone, hop on the phone for a call at any point in the future. You know, I'm I'm always open to that. More than happy to help. Of course, and I, and I know you'll you'll be coming down soon. So hopefully, yeah. we, we can have you here soon, brother. That would also be dope. <laughs> Definitely. Well, guys, um, nobody has any questions, anything to say. Uh, Adrian, give me a hand there, bright and. Uh, Young goalkeeper. Okay. <clears throat> uh, as a goalkeeper uh, myself, um, do you feel uh, that a part, like, because goalkeeping is a very different position than from all the other positions. So uh, I wanted to know that. Is there something different that other players as yourself or coaches expect of a goalkeeper? It's a good question. I mean, goalkeeper is a harder position. I think for sure they look for communication. Um, that's that's a big key um, factor there. Um, you know, and then and then everything else after that, they'll look at the intangibles and then what you bring to the position. You know, having good feet is very important in today's day and age, and, and being able to be trusted by your defenders to play you back passes, and you know, being able to even at times break lines, although it is dangerous, it's, it's a skill that really helps teams in the build up play. Um, but for sure, communication. And, and even, even with that, like our goalkeeper here at Michigan stars, he, he played with the Zimbabwe national team. 
Um, so he has international caps. He's played in the African Cup of Nations. Um, and, and so I'm sure he'd be more than happy to, to give you more specific advice. And I can ask him um, that question and, and have him give you a better answer. Because, again, I've, I'm not a goalkeeper, so I don't have all those answers. Um, but from my perspective, for sure, communication um, and just being confident, um, I think that goes a long way into giving confidence into the players in front of you. Yeah, I think uh, as a goalkeeper too, I think the communication aspect is really important. And it, it just saves you so much time. It saves you so many headaches. And no goalie likes to be shot at more than he could, you know, prevent by by talking. So I, I think your your point of view is is very is very important. Um, but but now Anthony, man, again, I really appreciate your time. Um, I'll be sending out your Instagram to, to the group that we have just so they can reach out to you, follow you, if anything. And, and now, man, we, we're just happy to, you know, have you in this process. Um, a lot of these guys and girls, they really are working for this dream. They're putting in the work. They are doing things differently. So just hearing your words, you know, it gives also me some peace of mind knowing that they're listening to the right voices which sometimes you lack them in this process and you hear the, let's just say the incorrect voices. So I know coming from someone like you that, you know, you've walked the talk, you live your life through faith, through being good. I think uh, you're the role model that I would like to, you know, show the, these guys and, and the guys that are coming behind them. For sure. I, I appreciate your kind words, Freddie. Um, and, and just to the group, you know, continue to put in that hard work because that's something that, it will go a long way and, and those rewards might not be immediate, but just fall in love with the process and, and stay true to that. Stay true to that work and, you know, listen to those guys the, they, they want what's best for you. Um, so just know where they're coming from. Anytime they give you instruction or feedback, it's coming from a place that, that they want the best for you. Trust the process. Yep, those are the words. Well, man, hope you have a good night, brother. Again, thank you for, for your time, your participation in this call. All right. Thank you, Fatty, and thank you. I appreciate it. See you, man. Yeah. ¿Qué les pareció, muchachos? María José no ha dicho nada hoy. Cuéntame, Majo, ¿qué te pareció? De nada, yo digo que bien, el oro claro, preciso. Y nada. Sí, realmente sé que muchos de ustedes tienen, están en una edad donde tienen muchas amistades y su círculo tal vez les metan muchas dudas en la, en la cabeza de si están haciendo lo correcto o si esto es el camino que ustedes deberían seguir. Y por eso es que estamos haciendo esto, es para que personas como Anthony les puedan dar su, su testimonio y que ustedes entiendan de personas que ya lo han vivido. No que ustedes cojan consejos de personas que nunca han pasado por ahí ni están haciendo el nivel de entrenamientos que ustedes están haciendo. Ustedes deben escuchar a personas que ya están ahí en ese punto y que se han fajado y se han, se han pasado años entrenando para llegar ahí. Entonces, de esos son los que hay que, de verdad, coger consejos y, y escuchar, de verdad. Entonces, ya habiendo dicho eso, podemos entrar en, en materia de lo que viene a, viene a ser el, el tema de esta, de esta semana. Tenemos ahí una tremenda jugadora, que es self-awareness. Entonces, ya como muchos de ustedes lo dijeron, self-awareness se refiere a la habilidad de, de, de entender las emociones, la raíz de, de, de los comportamientos, de, de mis reacciones, mi lenguaje corporal, de dónde viene. Al, al, al uno entender todas estas emociones y cosas que está sintiendo, uno las puede resolver mucho más fácil. Esto le ayuda a uno a mejorar muchos aspectos en el deporte, sobre todo en su liderazgo. Tienen mejor decision making a la hora de ustedes conocerse ustedes tienen empatía y ustedes pueden ponerse en los zapatos de las otras personas yo creo que esa es la cualidad que más se destaca de, de, de ser una persona self-aware que tú tienes empatía tú estás 
sintiendo lo que o te estás poniendo los zapatos de la otra persona, por lo que tu approach pueda ser diferente, por lo que tal vez como tú te refieras a esa persona, como le hables, sea de una manera distinta porque tú lo que quieres es el beneficio grupal y tú entiendes que esa persona tal vez esté pasando por algo y al tú tener esa empatía y ser self-aware de lo que está sucediendo en ti, que tal vez pueda estar sucediendo en esa persona, tú te puedes relacionar y tal vez crear una mejor eh, comunicación con ella. Entonces, créanme que esta cualidad yo creo que es de las más importantes si ustedes de verdad quieren llegar a ser capitanes y, de, y ser líderes en su, en su equipo. Hoy lo vamos a hacer un poco más corto y más directo. La última vez nos extendimos mucho y siento que les dimos mucha información. Por eso quiero que esto sea súper concreto y que entiendan que cuando uno señala, uno tiene un dedo mirando hacia adelante y tres mirando hacia uno. Entonces, antes de ustedes culpar los, fa los factores externos a su coach, a la cancha, al clima, miren dentro de ustedes qué estoy haciendo yo. Muchas veces uno comete errores y comete errores por falta de, de seguridad o por falta de confianza. Y la falta de confianza es netamente saber y dudar de ti. Sientes que tú no, no tienes eh, las habilidades suficientes para hacer ese dribbling, para hacer ese pase, para hacer ese tiro a puerta. Los errores suceden es cuando tú no tienes esa autoconfianza. Entonces, si ustedes de verdad quieren destacarse, eh, la única manera de tener esa confianza es entrenando más que el resto. Porque como decía Kobe Bryant en una entrevista, es un tiro más. Es un pase más. ¿Por qué cuando están en el último segundo del partido me la dan a mí? Porque yo sé lidiar con la presión y yo sé que yo he entrenado este tiro 50 mil veces. Y yo sé que para mí es un tiro más. Para otra persona tal vez sea algo mucho más grande. Pero para mí es un entrenamiento más. Una repetición extra. Y en ese momento es cuando ustedes logran tener esa confianza que les permite destacarse y ser ese jugador referente. Ese, ese, esa persona diferente. Entonces, aquí tenemos algunos beneficios de lo que es tener esa, esa autoconciencia. Primero, uno mejora la toma de decisiones, porque uno analiza desde una perspectiva más lógica y no se deja llevar por las emociones. Uno está controlando las emociones, las emociones no le están controlando a uno. Cuando eso pasa, uno analiza más y su lógica funciona mucho mejor. Por ende, la toma de decisiones y los errores mejoran. Los errores se reducen y la toma de decisiones mejora. Tienen una mejor comunicación. Cuando yo entiendo lo que me sucede a mí, cuando yo entiendo lo que estoy sintiendo, es mucho más fácil ponerlo en palabras y tal vez expresarme para que las otras personas me entiendan. Por ejemplo, Camilo en este momento no sabe qué está haciendo mal y por qué el entrenador no lo está poniendo. Si Camilo no lo sabe decir en palabras, tal vez el entrenador no vaya a entender el por qué Camilo se está sintiendo así y por eso no está rindiendo en la práctica o no está haciendo lo que él pide. Si Camilo tiene esa iniciativa y le dice, hey coach, ¿Qué necesitas de mí? ¿Qué cosas puedo mejorar? Yo sé que tengo estas, estas habilidades. ¿Qué más, más me hace falta para poder entrar en ese sistema que tú estás teniendo? Entonces, cuando tú tienes esa comunicación y logras decir, ok, no me siento bien, no estoy, no estoy teniendo la participación que tengo, que quisiera, déjame hablar con el entrenador desde el respeto, obviamente, y, y, y argumentar y preguntarle, hey, coach, ¿por qué no estoy teniendo los resultados que espero? En ese momento, cuando ustedes se comuniquen efectivamente, créanme que sus chances van a mejorar, sus chances de jugar y, y de destacarse van a, van a amplificarse muchísimo. Van a poder regular sus emociones. Muchas veces, muchos, hay varios muchachos que me hubiera gustado que estuvieran aquí, que tienen problemas con esto, que es que no regulan sus emociones. En un partido les hacen una falta, se comienzan a pelear con el árbitro, le van a dar un, un puño al, al compañero, al, al, otro, al del otro equipo, por, simplemente porque dejan que las emociones los controlen a ellos. Y yo se lo decía a muchos de ustedes, si ustedes en ese, llegan a ese punto, demuestran debilidad. Ustedes no tienen control de su cabeza, no tienen control de su mente, por ende, si yo soy un contrincante y veo eso, ya yo sé que voy ganando. Ya yo sé que es una persona débil de mente, que es una persona que si le, me, me le meto en la cabeza, lo voy a sacar del partido y voy a ganar, voy a ayudar a mi equipo al final un equipo gana porque comete menos errores si yo ya estoy en la cabeza de uno y lo estoy, y lo estoy ahí trabajando obviamente va a decaer y su equipo seguramente va a perder, solamente por un jugador porque esa es otra cosa building trust, cuando ustedes están jugando un deporte como el fútbol que juegan en equipo, ustedes 
tiene que confiar primero en sus habilidades, pero tiene que confiar en sus compañeros. Muchas veces uno, uno se equivoca porque no le quiere dar un pase a un compañero que está solo, pero uno sabe que tal vez la pierda. Y uno termina ten, eh, cometiendo ese error. Y eso pasa por no confiar en sus compañeros. Entonces, cuando uno tiene esa comunicación, regula sus emociones y puede conectar de esa manera, como en un nivel un poco más profundo con sus compañeros, pues tiene un, tiene un mejor manejo de grupo y las personas van a confiar en ti y tú vas a confiar en ellos y vas a poderles dar ese pase sabiendo que te, que te la pueden devolver esa pared. Entonces, de ahí vienen los beneficios de, de, de tú conocerte a ti mismo. Si tú no te conoces a ti, no vas a poder conocer a tus compañeros ni a tus enemigos. Primero empieza por uno. Entonces, en el momento que ya tú tengas todos estos beneficios, tú vas a comenzar a ver crecimiento personal, tú vas a comenzar a ser objetivo con tus comportamientos, vas a comenzar a analizar tus reacciones, vas a comenzar a analizar qué son los triggers que, 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 que hacen que esa, esa emoción salga a flote. ¿Por qué me enojo cuando me dicen esto? ¿Por qué no puedo tomar el feedback? ¿Por qué cuando me hacen una falta me incomodo? ¿Por qué cuando no me salen las cosas me frustro y tiro la cabeza para abajo? Esas son las preguntas que uno se tiene que hacer para poder conflict resolution, que lo dice aquí, para poder resolver esos conflictos. Son preguntas que ustedes se tienen que hacer ustedes mismos y entender de dónde vienen. Y ya, lo último va a ser la adaptability. El, el adaptability. Cuando ustedes conocen todas estas eh, emociones y comportamientos de ustedes mismos, se les va a ser mucho más fácil adaptarse a, a cualquier sistema, porque van a darse cuenta que no es un sistema que se tiene que adaptar a ustedes, sino son ustedes que van a ser parte de este conjunto, que no gira alrededor de ustedes, sino que ustedes son parte de, que todos están en una misma, en una misma organización, todos están en una misma institución, por ende, cuando tú eres self-aware, tu ego y tu vanidad tienen que estar aquí abajo, tu ego y tu vanidad tienen que estar aquí abajo, porque si no, tú no vas a poder estar en un equipo pensando que tú eres mejor que los demás. Y por ahí adelante en la presentación tenemos una frase que les va a hablar de esto, pero al final tú estás llegando a un sitio nuevo, por ejemplo, Camilo, Joshua, Alan, que están llegando a un sitio nuevo, tienen que adaptarse. Y esto empieza desde entender qué estoy haciendo bien y qué estoy haciendo mal y discernir cómo llegar a donde quiero llegar. Entonces ya con eso podemos dar al siguiente slide, Fede. Otra jugadora. ¿Cuál es la importancia? del self-awareness. Como ya les había dicho, al final, esto es un conjunto de cosas y de acciones que en el día a día tú te vas conociendo más y más. O sea, yo les puedo decir que yo tengo 25 años y todavía hay muchos comportamientos que yo me pregunto por qué los estoy teniendo cuando acabo un partido o cuando acabo una práctica. Y es como una, un, una mejora constante. Tú, no vas, tú siempre tratas de ser una mejor versión de ti mismo. Tú no aprendes una cosa y ya te vas a quedar ahí. Tú siempre tratas de mejorar poco a poco. Entonces, al final, la importancia de, de, de ser self-aware es que tú vas a tener un punto de referencia y vas a decir, ok, estoy aquí, pero quiero llegar aquí y tengo que mejorar las siguientes cosas para llegar a este punto. Es como poner un proceso a esa meta. Y, y de verdad tú entender que va a tomar trabajo y que vas a tener que lidiar con adversidad porque no todo gira alrededor tuyo, lo que les decía, el ego tiene que estar abajo, no todo gira alrededor tuyo, tú eres parte de un conjunto y siempre las decisiones del entrenador, siempre todo el, el, el interés del equipo va por encima del tuyo, así tú no estés jugando, tú tienes que tener una buena actitud con tus compañeros, con la práctica, con el coach, así no tengas los resultados que tú estás queriendo y esto al final te va a generar una satisfacción personal y te va a traer éxito en los deportes y en la vida. Porque es que no es solamente para jugar y para destacarse en, su, en tu equipo, sino esto también sirve para la vida. Tú estás teniendo un... un tú te vas a casar y, y, y tienes que entender por qué tú, lo, lo que hace tu pareja te incomoda. O sea, ya son cosas que tú trans, eh, transfieres a todos, los, a todos los aspectos de tu vida y te hacen ser mucho más objetivo contigo mismo. Entonces, vamos a darle el siguiente. que es un video de, de Kobe Bryant, donde él habla de cómo controlar las emociones. Aquí yo, te, si quieres, te paso el link Fede, para, que, para que lo pongas. Eh, ahí te lo pasé.
No, no se escucha. Tienes que quitarle el mute para que se escuche. Ah, bueno. Uh -huh. Dale, ponlo desde el principio. What I try to do is just try to be still and understand that things come and go, emotions come and go. The important thing is to accept them all, to embrace them all, and then you can choose to do with them the moment you want versus being controlled by emotion. What I try to do is just try to be still and understand. Eso que dice ahí es básicamente lo que les estaba diciendo. Ustedes no deben ser esclavos de su mente. Ustedes tienen que saber cómo manejar, cómo me estoy sintiendo y entender el porqué y solucionarlo y no quedarme en esa victimización de por qué me está sucediendo esto a mí. No, no es el mundo que está en contra tuya. No es que las cosas te salen mal solo a ti. Es como tú reaccionas a este tipo de situaciones y decir, ok, ¿qué estoy haciendo yo que me está poniendo en esta situación? Y tener la objetividad de preguntarse uno mismo y decir, ¿será que es el los 30 jugadores del equipo que no me quieren o será que soy yo que estoy mal y cuando tú entiendes eso pues créeme que tu, tu journey en, en, en cualquier equipo, club eh, trabajo va a mejorar porque es que tú vas a, vas a tomar ownership de la situación y no vas a responsabilizar a nadie más sino a ti tú no puedes controlar lo que hacen los otros tú solo puedes controlar lo que puedes hacer tú cómo aprendes de las cosas cómo reaccionas y los comportamientos que tienes cuando tú entiendes que tú, con 17 años que tienen ustedes, no vas a cambiar un entrenador que tiene 45, ustedes ya se sacan eso de la cabeza de que, ¿qué tengo que hacer para cambiar la mentalidad del entrenador? Nada, tú no vas a poder cambiar la mentalidad del entrenador, tú solo puedes cambiar lo que tú puedes hacer, que es entrenar más, poner tu mejor actitud para que él lo note, y ahí él tomar una, un, una acción. Pero ustedes, lamentablemente, no van a cambiar a una persona, primero que sea mayor que ustedes y que crea que sabe más que ustedes. Entonces, por eso, ahí al final tenemos una, una frase bien importante. Pero ahora vamos a pasar a lo que es el, la inteligencia emocional, que Fede les va a hablar un poquito más acerca de eso. Claro. Eh, bueno, como dice aquí la, la presentación, la inteligencia emocional es básicamente nuestra habilidad de reconocer, entender, manejar y usar nuestras emociones efectivamente para manejarnos entre todo lo que es nuestro ecosistema deportivo y usualmente eso es nuestros compañeros, entrenadores y el oponente. Y para no básicamente leerle, chicos, lo que dice, lo que dice ahí, la, la inteligencia emocional, una cosa es tu, tu IQ y otra cosa es tu EQ. Eh, ¿han, es, ¿Han escuchado lo, lo que ha pasado con... Eh, ¿Cómo se llama? Con FTX, el fondo de cripto. ¿Alguien sabe? Sam Bankman Fried. Na, nadie ha escuchado lo, lo que ha pasado con el mundo del cripto. Sí, bueno. esa fue un gente y quebró su empresa. Bueno, hay un señor, un chico que se llama Sam Bankman Fried, que él empezó un fondo de cripto. Y en ese fondo, básicamente en el boom de cripto, todo el mundo empezó a depositar su dinero ahí. Y el chico empezó a usar ese dinero para usarlo para beneficio propio y empezó a patrocinar atletas profesionales como Tom Brady, empezó a, a ponerle el logo en, los, en el estadio del Miami Heat y el punto es que el chico ya lo condenaron porque perdió más de 9 billones de dólares y el chico siempre fue inteligente, el chico siempre fue brillante, pero su emotional coefficient era muy bajito porque el chico no sabía hablar, en las entrevistas se le notaba que era un, un huevón para no decirle en otras palabras, y al final el chico va a perder toda su vida y todo lo que creó por no tener inteligencia emocional. Entonces, en lo deporte pasa, y ustedes seguro conocen al que es muy bueno, pero tiene ser inteligencia emocional, que usualmente no es alguien que, es, que se lleva muy bien con la gente, o no lo respetan tanto. Entonces, como dije al principio, la, tu inteligencia emocional es tu habilidad de mirar para adentro, primero. Porque ustedes que están en situaciones, María José, Alan, Joshua, que no están con su mamá y su papá al lado, donde no tienen ese comfort. Entonces, esa habilidad de ustedes percibir sus emociones, yo entiendo que es algo sumamente importante. Aquí, algunos de, de, los, de los beneficios, yo entiendo que el primero, como ya lo hemos hablado, es el tema de, de self-awareness. 
que literalmente, señor, el, el atleta que no mira para adentro no va para ningún lado. Porque como que yo digo, ah, sí, yo soy bueno. Pero bueno en relación a qué? Bueno en relación a, a la Liga Fútbol 5 que yo juego o en relación a la gente que yo admiro y quisiera ser como ellos. Self-regulation, que es... Uy, Self-regulation, que es básicamente cómo tú manejar tus emociones constructivamente. Cuando tú eres un atleta, tú siempre estás en situaciones de alta presión, donde tú te rodeas de gente que, que va a actuar impulsivamente, ese compañero de equipo que falló un gol, o ese, o ese entrenador que te dijo algo. Y al final ese self-regulation es tu manera de, de coger el fuego y decir, ok, tranquilo, yo vuelvo a mi zona de zen. La motivación... Eh, Seguro todo el que ha jugado fútbol sabe que cuando uno hace algo bien, todo el mundo lo aplaude, pero yo creo que el mejor aplauso es el que tú te das a ti mismo, porque si tú necesitas de que te digan que tú eres bueno y tú no reconoces que tú eres bueno, eh, tú siempre vas a depender del aplauso externo. Y yo entiendo que el self-awareness y la inteligencia emocional lo que más te ayuda a entender que irrelevante de lo que me digan, yo sé lo que yo valgo. Y ustedes que están tratando de, de mostrarse ante coaches, ante universidades, lo que están aquí, que estamos trabajando con ustedes, como que, señores, si su motivación no es intrínseca y su motivación depende de que ganaron la, la Copa Malta Morena, pues cuando estén allá, allá afuera, de verdad le va a ser muy difícil, porque la mejor motivación es la motivación que sale de, de adentro. Eh, la empatía, yo creo que eso ustedes lo saben ya, el jugador y el atleta y persona que no es empático, le van a cerrar mucha puerta. Seguro ustedes se han dado cuenta, los que están allá afuera, que si no tratan bien a ese profesor, ese profesor le hace así. Y ustedes, ay, pero profesor, ayúdame. Ay, que ustedes no quieren ser empáticos. Entonces, con el deporte, con los estudios, con la novia, con el novio, con la familia, la empatía es muy importante, señores, porque el mundo no gira alrededor de nosotros. El mundo gira independientemente de que uno esté o no esté. Y, por último, el tema de sus habilidades sociales. Yo sé porque pasamos por ahí todo lo que pasa en su último año, en su penúltimo año, la presión. Pero lo que sí le, le puedo decir es que, es que sus habilidades sociales traten de evaluarla en qué ustedes hacen cuando nadie está viendo. Como que cuando nadie te está grabando, cuando nadie te está diciendo, aplaudiendo como que cuáles son sus habilidades y cómo ustedes usan esas habilidades positivamente. Porque ustedes como atletas siempre van a tener una conversación con alguien que esa conversación tal vez se ve irrelevante, pero el día de mañana le puede abrir muchas puertas. Entonces, si ustedes solamente creen que el fútbol es yo quiero, gano, yo, 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 el fútbol se le acaba muy rápido y después de ahí la persona no, no te van a preguntar de que, ay, ¿y qué tan buen jugador tú fuiste? No, la gente te va, a te va a preguntar cuál es tu calidad humana, cómo tú sabes relacionarte, cómo tú sabes de verdad desenvolverte. Entonces yo entiendo que ahí es que, es que el emotional intelligence de verdad es importante. Y bueno, Seba, aquí la, la frase que tú, que tú querías decir, que it is not possible to learn what you think you already know. Y yo creo que bueno que tú pongas ahí la foto de, de Joshua y Camilo, que creo que lo han tenido que aprender a la mala. No, no fue... No fue a propósito, ¿eh? Fue coincidencial. Pero qué bueno que estén ahí, porque ustedes más que nadie se han dado cuenta que si ustedes no están dispuestos a aprender, no no van a llegar a ningún sitio. O sea, si tú eres un estudiante, uno primero tiene que tener una, una actitud de estudiante para toda la vida. Uno no se cansa de aprender. Uno no simplemente para de, de aprender. Uno está aprendiendo todo el tiempo. Y no es posible aprender lo que tú piensas que tú ya sabes. Y muchos de ustedes creen que uno les está diciendo, o incluso cuando sus padres les hablan, les están diciendo las cosas por molestarlos. A mí me, a mí me lo decían mis padres y yo también me entraba por aquí, me salía por aquí. Y es porque uno cree que ya lo sabe, pero... Al final nunca está de más que le digan todo eso, porque uno, al final ustedes son unos menores todos. O sea, al final ustedes son jóvenes, a ustedes todavía les faltan por vivir muchas cosas que Fede y yo ya vivimos, que Anthony ya vivió. Entonces nosotros sabemos por lo que ustedes están pasando y cuando uno les dice algo, es pensando en su beneficio y en su, y en su, y en su interés a largo plazo. Entonces, 
por eso uno siempre tiene que tener primero esa humildad y como dice ahí, less ego, more knowledge. Si tú no estás dispuesto a bajar tu ego, tú nunca vas a subir tu coachability. Si tu coachability es malo, olvídate de que vas a ser futbolista o, o deportista. Si tú no puedes tomar instrucciones de un coach y tratar de aprender y entenderla, no vas a llegar a ningún lado. Y uno lo dice así como medio, medio, medio sueldo, pero es algo importante. O sea, si tú no estás dispuesto a escuchar lo que te dicen los otros por tu bien, tú lo que crees es que tú eres el más duro y, y te vas a quedar siendo duro, como dicen aquí. Y va a llegar un sitio en el que tú crees que ya sabes todo y no vas a poder avanzar y te vas a quedar ahí, te vas a poner tu propio techo tú solo. Porque crees que ya lo sabes todo. Y créanme que uno llega a los 20, 30, 40 años y uno todavía está aprendiendo cosas nuevas. Y usen todo esto que les estamos diciendo como un ejercicio. Pónganse en situaciones que ustedes no están acostumbrados a estar. Pónganse a hablar con profesores. Pónganse a hablar con... Así ustedes no sepan y tengan nervios. Está bien. Está bien sentir esos nervios, como decía Kobe. Está bien sentir esas emociones. Ahora, ¿qué vas a hacer para, para, para overcome them? ¿Sabes? ¿Qué vas a hacer para, para traspasarlas? Entonces, ya con esa pregunta yo creo que eso era todo lo que teníamos preparado para ustedes. Perdón, esa frase, no esa pregunta. Muchas gracias por su tiempo. Muchas gracias a Anthony porque pudo estar aquí. Acuérdense que esto lo hacemos netamente pensando en su beneficio y en ustedes. No estamos aquí perdiendo el tiempo. Nadie quiere venir a, a gastar saliva y, y, y gastar una hora de su tiempo para algo que no le aporte. Y nosotros consideramos que esto... A mí por lo menos me aporto. Yo estoy aprendiendo y lo estoy haciendo yo. Yo soy el que tengo que hacer las presentaciones y yo estoy aprendiendo. Entonces yo sé que ustedes tienen algo que sacar de aquí. Entonces nada muchachos, activos y nos vemos la próxima semana. No, en dos semanas para la siguiente clase. Vamos a tener otro invitado, un psicólogo deportivo. Entonces créanme que si tienen preguntas, estas dos semanas, planteenlas. Porque vamos a tener una persona que se, se dedica específicamente a psicología deportiva, entonces ustedes saben lo que eso les puede traer en, en, a la hora de jugar, la importancia de la psicología deportiva entonces nada, aprovechenlo, muchas gracias muchachos, eh, y nada fe gracias a ti también por participar no sé si alguien tenga una pregunta o duda, o algo más que decir algo que quieran añadir Jorge Dite algo, Jorge. Eh, bueno, o sea, yo llevo un rato que no decir que la palabra de Anthony, o sea, todo lo que salió de su boca fue total humildad. Eh, o sea, lo escuchaba hablar y, o sea, era una, una humildad increíble. Eh, sin, o sea, no dio de su tiempo, o sea, aprendí, mira que aprendí un poco de cómo él manejó las situaciones que él vivió. O sea, teniendo tres, tres operaciones en high school, la mayoría de la gente se, se retractaría, diría, mierda, o sea, tres operaciones para que seguir. Y él básicamente overcome eh, todas esas situaciones y llegó a División 1 de jugando profesional. Y yo veo eso, o sea... Eso que es primera. Obstáculo es el camino. Eso es lo que quería decir antes. La única manera de tú llegar a donde quieres es poniéndote en situaciones donde te vas a sacar de tu zona de confort y en donde tú no estás acostumbrado a estar. Esa es la única manera de, de aprender, de verdad, y desenvolverte y de, y de adaptarte a cosas que tú no estás acostumbrado a vivir. Y así es que tú creces como persona, no solo como atleta, poniéndote en esas situaciones. Por eso lo, lo, lo que les digo... Muchas de mis oportunidades en la universidad me llegaron porque yo las buscaba, no porque estaba esperando que alguien llegara a mí a decirme, hey, mira, está esto. Entonces, póngase en esas situaciones, que si yo no me las hubiera puesto en ese momento, tal vez no sería la persona que soy hoy en día. It's not about the grace you make, but the hand you shake. ¿Verdad, Fede? A mí nadie me ha preguntado cuál era mi GP en el colegio o la universidad. Ojalá me lo hubieran dicho antes. Sí. Igual a mí. Me agradó con un 2.5. Para el que sepa, el que no sabe. Bueno, contigo. 
que nada chicos, gracias por su tiempo espero que haya sido de, de valor y nada, nos mantenemos al tanto nada, esperamos que les haya gustado muchachos y chicas, nos vemos chao chao